Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's three years almost exactly since you... It is, yes. It, it hardly seems possible. The time has flown by, but please do have a seat. Thank you. Does, does it feel like it's flown by, actually? Does it feel like it's all, all been over in a flash? Well, it, I suppose it does in one sense. There's so much that happens, and I know, obviously, <laughs> a lot of people know quite a lot about what's been happening. But, uh, you know, things are happening every day, government business every day, dealing with things every day. So you're constantly sort of thinking about things and moving forward. What's it like living above the shop? Uh, well, it's very convenient. <laughs> um, but it's, it's uh, you know, at any point in time, you can obviously get a call. People can be bringing papers up to you. Um, it's really, in a sense, it, it's a place of work. Um, you know, there's the red box is done mm. in the evenings. It was here, of course, that I took the phone call about the terrible terrorist attack in Manchester. You know, so this is somewhere where um, you are constantly on call. What was then the, the, the hardest conversation like that that you had to have in here? Um, well, I suppose that probably was, that was one of the hardest. Um, hearing, particularly that attack, which mm. was absolutely terrible, which had focused and targeted children and young people, which was absolutely appalling. Um, it's very difficult when you hear something like, like that has happened. You have, obviously, immediately the decisions to be taken, there are people to be seen, the police, the security services, trying to understand more about what has happened, making sure the emergency services have what they need to be able to provide for people and support people. Uh, but it's, it's really absolutely chilling when you get a call like that. And I suppose in those three years, there have been so many difficult moments. How did you managed to get through it all? I mean, your colleagues often talk about your astonishing resilience, just that ability to keep going. Where do you think that comes from? I, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just sort of me, but I mean, it's important that I've had, uh, you know, Philip, my husband is hugely supportive um, and that's been, that's been important. I've always said that though, it, the other important thing is just to keep a vision on where you're trying to get to, what you're trying to achieve. So there will be setbacks, there will be problems. Um, sadly, of course, I haven't managed to get Brexit over the line. I'm disappointed about that and frustrated about that. But uh, you keep that end goal in sight, whatever you're doing. I mean, some of those nights, those big votes, those big defeats in the Commons when you'd work so hard to try to get a deal. I mean, some, you say that you sometimes you were frustrated, but did you ever just come home here at the end of the day and feel really angry? that people who said they wanted to get Brexit done just wouldn't vote for a deal that you'd worked so hard to achieve? Well, I suppose I'd assumed um, that, that a parliament that had voted to give people the choice, that had then voted to uh, trigger Article 50, 80% um, mm. uh, of people in the 2017 election voted for parties that said they would respect the referendum. And I assumed that people therefore would be eager to get Brexit over the line and to, uh, and to support you know, delivering on, on the vote for people. So, but it was disappointment. And what happens if you, you know, when you've lost a vote like that, yes, you have, you reflect on why and what's happened, but then you actually have to pick yourself up and the team has to pick itself up and you go out because you've got to work out how can we try to get this through. Was there ever a moment though where you sat in here at the end of a hard day and just thought, actually, I just wish it was over? Um, there are moments when I sat here and thought, I wish we'd got Brexit over the line. <laughs> I wish we'd actually managed to achieve that. And, you know, we, through the thing, we're going to have to have another go at that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, because there was always that sense that I've had of wanting to deliver Brexit, but also the other things that I've wanted to do yeah. as Prime Minister, many of the things I've been able to do, um, that, that's what keep, kept, me, uh, kept me on, spurred me on. Will you leave here as well with happy memories of this as a, as a place of work, but also somewhere that you lived and did the job that you dreamt of doing for a long time? Yes, I will leave with happy memories. I mean, it's, it's not, and it, you know, I felt it at home here as Prime Minister, but it's, it's not obviously the home that Philip and I built up together. Um, so, and it is, as I've said, very much a place of work. But there are happy memories because it is an immense privilege to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It's a huge honour, it has a huge responsibility, but I'm immensely proud to have been able to do it for three years. And what are some of the good memories then that you'll leave with? The good memories, 
actually, it's a lot about the people you meet. Um, some fantastic people I meet. So, for example, at the D-Day commemorations, the D-Day veterans, absolutely amazing. Some of their stories about what they had done, what they'd been through. But then there are other people I meet, like, I, I don't know if you remember when there was a British diving team that went out to rescue those boys in Thailand in the cave. And I met the diving team. We brought them to number 10. And they were just people you would, wouldn't recognise in the street. You'd walk past in the street, ordinary people doing ordinary jobs. But they had this passion for diving. Um, when they saw some those boys in trouble, they went out there and they rescued them. And they were completely bemused as to why people were mm. giving them so much attention, because they'd just done what they thought it was right to do. And so there are all sorts of things, including lots of really you know, positive things that happened in your time here. Do you feel in a way frustrated that somehow the public didn't necessarily see that? You know, you were often accused by your opponents of being too buttoned up, being too closed. You know, do you wish you'd maybe shown a bit more of, your, more of yourself to the public? Well, this is always a, a, a difficult question because I don't recognise myself in some of the descriptions that people give of me. Um, and, but you know, I think in this role, the responsibility is that you have to, you've got a job to do and you need to focus on actually delivering that job. And I think actually that's what members of the public want at the end of the day. They want a Prime Minister who's interested in doing things that will improve their lives. Did it get to you that you think you were a bit unfairly represented? Um, well, if, nobody likes to be uh, to have descriptions of them that they don't think are right. Um, but that's what happens in politics. You know, this isn't, it doesn't only happen to prime ministers. Um, throughout uh, a political life, you have to be prepared for the fact that people will portray you in ways that you might not agree with. And just lastly, when you leave in about 10 days or so, what do you think you'll feel when you walk out the door as Prime Minister for the last time? Um, I think it'll be a mixture of pride at having done the job, um, but also uh, a degree of disappointment because there was more that I wanted to do. I think we have, have achieved a lot over the last three years, but whenever you come to the end of a Premiership, I think everybody will always feel that there is more that they wanted to do. It's bittersweet. Well, it's it, immense pride, as I say, as well. So now we're at the famous staircase. So before too long, your picture will be up there. What do you hope people will remember of you in years to come compared to all of these other Prime Ministers? Well, I, the first thing I hope will th is that people will recognise the second female Prime Minister. Huh? And I actually hope, in years to come, that there'll be more women on the, uh, on the wall as Prime Minister. Uh, is that something that's been on your mind a lot during your time in office? Not, uh, not consciously, but it's interesting. I do get, you know, particularly young girls who will say how great it is to have a woman as Prime Minister and how that spurs them on to be ambitious for the future. Um, so, Prime Minister, first of all, your time in office has been dominated by Brexit. You worked extremely hard to get a deal through, but why do you think it didn't happen? Well, I think one of the things that I underestimated was that I, I thought that Parliament, having voted to give people the choice, 80% uh, of people in the 2017 general election voted for parties that said they would respect the referendum. Parliament overwhelmingly voted to trigger Article 50. And I had expected and assumed that Parliament, therefore, wanted to come together to agree a deal and get us out of the European Union. What I had underestimated was that there were people who were in entrenched positions. So on the one hand, some people who'd always campaigned for Brexit but didn't vote for the deal because they had a particular vision of Brexit and they were sticking firmly to that vision. And on the other side, people who said they didn't want to leave with no deal but weren't prepared to vote for a deal in order to make sure that what they wanted happened. So I think I'd under I underestimated the... Uh, unwillingness of parts, some people in Parliament to compromise. And what about your own responsibility though? Because partly to lead is to bring people together and some of your critics would say you should take responsibility for that because you drew red lines at the beginning. People have said you were only willing to compromise at the very last moment. 
Yeah. What, I, what people say to me is, on the one hand, that I stuck too firmly to my red lines, and on the other hand, people say, and sometimes the same people, say that I gave up too much, I compromised too much, and both of these cannot be true. Do you think it was impossible for you to get the deal through? Well, if, uh, by definition, no, I didn't think it was impossible. That's why I kept trying to get the deal through. And, of course, each time we saw more people voting for the deal. I think one of the, um, there were these entrenched positions, there was also uh, an opposition in the Labour Party who I th were more interested in actually breaking the Conservatives than in, than in delivering on Brexit, despite having stood on a manifesto to deliver on Brexit. But do you and think that added another element into the parliamentary situation. And of course, the parliamentary arithmetic is, was difficult. But do you think there are things you got the wrong though, or things that you would do differently now that might have changed that situation? Well, I think, I mean, I still think it was a good deal. I think it was a good deal. I think in terms of how we did the negotiations, one of the issues was the sequencing. Now, what does that mean? It means that we were talking, if you like, about the divorce um, rather than talking at, at first and mm. not talking at the same time about the future relationship. In fact, we managed to talk rather more about the future uh, in the overall deal than I think the EU originally intended to and had expected to. So we managed to get them to compromise on that and pull them on that. Um, but I think, and I think there's a general feeling, including in some, for some in Europe, that if actually the whole package had been negotiated at the same time, we wouldn't have had the issue, same issue over the backstop. Uh, uh, we'd have been looking at exactly what the future was as well as what the divorce was, what and, the breakup was. And that's in, in terms of the, the kind of dynamics of the negotiations, but in terms of persuading people in Parliament to back that deal, are there things you wish you'd done differently? Well, look, one could always look back and say, if I'd sat down and talked to people more often, I spent a lot of time talking to colleagues, trying to understand from colleagues exactly what it was that was creating a problem for them. Um, on both sides, because I, I, I've pointed out to those who have consistently said they don't want no deal, that in order to leave, uh, if it's not leaving with no deal, you have to leave with a deal. And they had the opportunity to vote for that deal. And there are some, of course, as we've seen, some MPs now, some Labour MPs, who are now regretting the fact that they didn't vote for a deal. Yeah, that must be extremely frustrating for you. I mean, does that make, not make you angry? You, you've, you tried and failed and tried again to get a deal through and now some people say, oh, actually, maybe I should just have voted for it. Well, look, it's incredibly frustrating. What I hope is that uh, you know, my successor now has the job of bringing a majority together in Parliament and I hope they will be able to find that majority to ensure that we leave in a good way for the United Kingdom. I still think that's to leave with a good deal. And do you think, in a way, something that looks a bit like your deal will actually end up being how we depart. Look, we have to see how my successor takes their relationship with the European Union forward, the discussions they have with the, with the EU. What I hope is uh, that, because I think we need, to, we need to deliver Brexit, we need to do it in a good way for the United Kingdom, and I still believe that's to leave with a good deal. What was it like dealing with the EU? I mean, you are a you know, consummate professional politician who's always, you know, you, you always used to say you would not talk about the negotiation because you didn't want to give anything away. But there were, were some moments where we saw a flash of what it was like at times. In particular, I'm thinking of when Jean-Claude Juncker suggested that your position was nebulous. We saw then how angry you were with him. What was it like dealing with the EU? Well, look, the, the, there, were, the, there were tough negotiations. There were always going to be tough negotiations. It's a diplomatic way of putting well, it. Well, they, they were tough negotiations, and I've always said that they were going to be tough. I think one of the challenges in those negotiations, though, was the way in which we saw uh, things being said on both sides in public. Um, you know, right at the beginning, I said I wasn't going to give a running commentary on negotiations. I've talked to people who've done commercial negotiations who've said to me, of course, the benefit they had was doing them in private. <laughs> Um, and when you've got all these things, including things being said from the EU side, um, that that makes it harder to sit down with people and to conduct negotiations in you know, the professional um, way that I think is, is, is what gets to the best result for people. One of the things also that happened a lot was your colleagues who you sat with around this table, a lot of them were also quite fond of saying what they thought, which was not exactly the same always as you thought. 
I mean, you must have been furious at the number of leaks that came out of this cabinet. I mean, did you ever tell them off around this table? Well, by definition, I don't approve of leaking from cabinet, so I don't say uh, what I say, what I've said <laughs> at cabinet. Um, but the the uh, look, every decision, every position that the government took was a collective, agreed position, agreed by cabinet, um, and that's what we took into into negotiations, whether it was the um, proposals in the Chequers plan, whether it was the, the um, agreements that we've, we had, going back to the EU, trying to find a way, because I, I, you know, I, I did everything I could to get a deal. Mm. I uh, sacrificed my job in order to try to get a, uh, to try to get a deal. Um, I sat down and tried to get a compromise with Jeremy Corbyn to try to get a deal that would get through, that would get through Parliament. But it must have driven you mad, surely, when the colleagues you were meant to be able to trust didn't show the same discipline in public that you did and that you have done throughout your whole career? Well, I think there is a challenge for government. Good government, good cabinet government depends on collective responsibility and on what is said within the cabinet room and at other obviously important ministerial meetings staying there. And, uh, and I think that is something, the Brexit debate there are huge passion, passionately held views on, on the issue of Europe. But I think once we have left the EU, we can get, and government can get forward over that Brexit issue, collective responsibility needs to return. It, part of the problem, of course, all the way through was that you lost your majority in 2017. Do you now regret calling that election? I mean, can you say that? No, no I don't regret calling the election. I, I regret... Um, running a campaign that wasn't really me. Um, there were other things I think I probably actually should have done the TV debates. I'd seen them in uh, 2010 particularly, mm -hmm. um, taking the lifeblood out of the campaign. Um, but, you know, I, and obviously I wanted a, a, a different result to come out of the election. Um, but I, I no, I don't think it's, it's interesting. A uh, number of colleagues have said to me, despite the result, that they don't think it was wrong to, to call an election. The day after the election, or that, that awful night for you, did you think about resigning at that moment? It was, quite, it was a moment of, of shock. And what I had to do was sit and reflect and think, what is, how do we take this forward? But what was crucial for me was actually keeping the party together and keeping the focus on what we needed to do in terms of delivering for, pe for people. And, and that was what I was thinking about. And your party has been through a terrible time. I mean, the rowing and the infighting and the level of hostility on different sides of the Tory party has been intense in the last few years. Do you worry about the Conservative Party that you've been part of and, and loved for most of your life? The Conservative Party is the longest standing, most successful political party in, uh, in I think, in the Western world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always been a party that has been able, that has key principles, but is able to adapt to, uh, to circumstances. So I don't worry about the Conservative Party. I believe the Conservative Party will be strong. You talk about, yes, the passionately held views on mm. Europe and the debate and arguments that have been about the European issue. The Labour Party has equally seen um, debate and argument about the European issue. As you leave number 10, are you worried about the country and the level of bitterness in our politics right now? Well, I think, I would say that actually I think on the Brexit issue, the public uh, haven't got that degree of polarisation that exists in Parliament. Um, I think what we've seen in Parliament is not a reflection of the general public. I think more widely, there is an issue for us all in politics about the way debate on many issues is held, about the way um, particularly we've seen some MPs um, being subject to significant harassment, mm -hmm. um, bullying, um, some really uh, hateful things being said on social media particularly, some of which have led to criminal action, you know, to people being charged and prosecuted for what they've been doing. We need our politics to be able to debate in a reasoned way. People will have different views. Let's air those views reasonably. Let's debate them and let the public decide. I know that you don't want to endorse either of the candidates of the people who want to succeed you, but do you think that Boris Johnson understands the seriousness of this office? 
Look, I think both of, both of the candidates to succeed me have held very senior positions in the Cabinet, very senior positions in government. They've been close to the Prime Minister. They've seen the responsibilities of, a, of the Prime Ministerial job. I th they've both borne uh, significant responsibilities in the Cabinet positions they've held. I think they understand the responsibility that this job brings. And what about your dealings with Donald Trump? I mean, you cr clearly tried extremely hard to have a respect respected and constructive relationship with the American president. Do you think that Donald Trump has always treated you, the UK, and the office of the British Prime Minister with the respect it deserves? The relationship with the United States isn't about two people. It's about two countries that have stood shoulder to shoulder, shoulder, to shoulder in some of the darkest hours that we have seen over the last century or more. Uh, and that relationship continues and it will continue regardless of the personalities either here in Downing Street or in the White House. I've always found in my personal dealings with, with uh, President Trump we've been able to have some rigorous discussions, um, some open discussions of things we disagree with him on. I've been very clear with him. I think he should be part of the Paris Agreement on climate change, for example. But it must have been challenging dealing with such a maverick. Well, President Trump is somebody who's come to the presidency from a different background from most people. Most people come from a political background. They've had experience in, in uh, politics in America before. Um, some have been senators, governors, etc. Um, he comes from a different background, so he approaches his politics in a different way. And will you appoint a new ambassador to Washington before you leave, or will that be for your successor? An, an, an ambassador will be appointed in due course. What I want more widely is that all our public servants should know that they should be open and frank in what they say to ministers. Let's talk more widely, because Brexit has been so dominant during your time, but it's certainly not everything that you've had to do. What are you most proud of? Gosh, well... You're right, Brexit has, has taken up a lot of people's thinking, but actually there's an enormous amount that has been done um, behind that. I'm proud of the fact that our balanced approach to the economy means we see employment at record levels, unemployment at a record low, youth unemployment halved. Um, I'm, we see wages now rising faster than inflation. Uh, as I said at my party conference, we're able to bring an end to austerity. We've been able to inject, we, we'll be injecting that extra £20 billion mm. into the NHS giving the NHS that security and stability for the future is so important for people. We're building more homes for people. That's really important. I worry that there has been a generation who've been fearful that they, their future would not be as bright as, as their parents. Um, and having their own home was part of that. But then I'm also proud of giving a voice to the voiceless, of championing some causes that otherwise would be unfashionable. Um, I've had two round tables in the last week here talking to um, survivors, to people supporting, uh, to parliamentarians interested in domestic violence and domestic mm. abuse. Hugely important issue, what I've done on modern slavery, the race disparity audit mm. that I set up that actually shines a light on the inequalities and injustices in the way people are treated by our public services. And you have picked some causes and put policy effort into things that maybe were unpredictable for a Conservative Prime Minister. I, I remember you said so clearly in your campaign, I'm Theresa May and I'm the best person to be Prime Minister. Given everything that's happened, everything that's gone right and everything that's gone wrong, do you still feel that that was the case? <laughs> well, by, by definition, I'm, I'm not going to say, no, I wasn't the right person. <laughs> I do believe I was the right person to take this on and to take the Conservative Party. Yes, there was Brexit, and Brexit was difficult, and Brexit has been challenging and remains a challenge for my successor. But actually, at the time that I became Prime Minister, I believe it was important as Prime Minister to show that a Conservative Prime Minister was interested in some of these issues. I was building on the work that David Cameron had done. But as I said when I became Prime Minister, outside this building, I wanted to deal with injustices. So what I've been doing on things like the race disparity audit, but also putting more money and more emphasis on mental health, mm. for example, these are dealing with injustices. And uh, I'm setting up an independent office for tackling injustices that will ensure that government has an evidence base, the data is there, that government can develop policy to make sure it's developing the best policy to deal with these so that we are able to end some of these injustices that have 
sadly for some, for some people, have blighted their lives. Just finally, what will you miss? Um, well, I won't miss being on call <laughs> all the time. Um, I mean, I'm, I will miss the opportunity to meet you know, people who have contributed to this country in so many different ways and who are often unsung and unheard. And I'll, so I'll miss the opportunity to be able to go sometimes and just say thank you to people for what they're doing for this country. And, you know, I hope that whoever um, people are, whether they voted for the Conservative Party or for other parties, whether they um, have were leavers or remainers, whatever they felt, I hope that they will feel that in everything I've done, I've always done what I believe to be in the national interest. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed.